Dennis, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki, and welcome to the 427th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and another great virtual Imagine lecture hosted by the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. This 10 week summer series focuses on creating a culture of sustainability. We're asking the question, what would a sustainable community look like? So we've asked the uh, representatives from the public and private sectors, uh, the nonprofit and education sectors uh, to speak to that question. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History, and Nature, or Cezanne, as I pronounce the acronym, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speakers shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted uh, during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We'll have time for questions at the end, so if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channels. And we ask you to share the link with your friends and networks. As a reminder, Life Willing will be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. with a great lineup of local speakers. Now, today's featured speakers are Jay Burney and J. Jean Rose Burney. Jay Burney has spent a lifetime loving, learning about, and sharing ideas about how to best protect our planet. Uh, he is the special project director of the Pollinator Conservation Association and founder of the Friends of Times Beach Nature Preserve. He is one of the founders of our of Buffalo's Our Outer Harbor Coalition. This group was formed when development proposals threatened the ecological, uh, ecological integrity of the Buffalo uh, Outer Harbor, which is located along with Times Beach at the confluence of Lake Erie, the Buffalo River, and the Niagara River Strait. The group advocates uh, advocates keeping Outer Harbor's pub publicly owned natural resources green. This includes habitat conservation and restoration. He is chair of the Niagara Greenway Pollinator Partnership, which seeks to influence strategic conservation policies and educational initiatives. Now, J. Jean Rose Burney is the deputy director of the Western uh, New York Land Conservancy. He has been with the Land Conservancy since 2013. He has a bachelor's degree in environmental design and a master's degree in urban planning, both from the University at Buffalo, UB. Now, after graduating in 2007, he worked at the Urban Design Project, a research center at UB on several local planning efforts, environmental coalition building, and nonprofit development. From 2010 to 2012, he served as a Peace Corps volunteer stationed with Mexico's Federal Environmental Agency in Puebla, a large city in Southern Mexico, along with his wife, Anna. Jean has written on environmental topics, leads bird and nature tours, and has worked with several environmental organizations. Okay, let's welcome Jay Burney and Jay Jean Rose Burney. Jay? Lead us off. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to do a screen share here. Um, get that going. Uh, can you all see that? Okay, listen, I'm very excited to be here today. And I'm especially excited to be sharing this platform with the other Bernie, um, who uh, you know is, is my son. And this is just a fantastic opportunity to talk to you, um, both of us. I'm going to be giving a very shortened version of a presentation that I normally give. This is gonna be about seven minutes and usually it's 40 minutes. So uh, bear with me. Um, I think this stuff is very translatable in a, in a short period. 
And so uh, basically the idea is making resilient mm -hmm. normal. We have to figure out how to do that because you know resiliency means survival. And uh, we're not doing a very good job of it. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And creating a culture of sustainability. I have a lot of background in sustainability. I ran a sustainability uh, conference several years ago. It had speakers like David Suzuki and Jane Goodall. So I've been in sustainability and uh, try to understand what it is and trying to work with it for, for a long time. Uh, the major thing that I, I like to start with is that we live in a pretty rare place. Earth is a very rare paradise. It's probably unique. It might not be unique in the, in the universe, but as far as we know, it is. And so we have a responsibility to take care of our planet uh, if we're going to survive, and if anything is going to survive. And, you know, I think most of us are concerned about humans surviving, um, and it, it's, it's a tough road ahead. Uh, I work uh, in the Outer Harbor quite a lot and in the Niagara River Greenway. Um, as Dennis mentioned, the Outer Harbor is a very special place uh, that links our city, our community, our urban areas to the water. And the water is really, uh, water is life. You've probably heard that before. And, and our biggest uh, access to the waterfront um, currently is the Outer Harbor in Buffalo. And um, there are threats, threats of development. I also am the special projects director and actually recently got a, a um, a promotion. I'm now the uh, um, acting executive director of the Pollinator Conservation Association. And I'll be glad to talk to anybody about any of this stuff as we move on. So let's talk about the Outer Harbor. Uh, you know, we're fighting for green, greener, greener stuff. And we look at biodiversity as one of the roles in helping to create atmospheric stability, which has everything to do with climate change. And so building for resiliency is what we talk about, what we advocate on the Outer Harbor and throughout the Niagara Greenway and our region. These two pictures are slightly different versions of, of what development might look like on the Outer Harbor. The top is just parking for some of the big events that are being held down there. And the bottom picture suggests that there might be some alternatives to, uh, to having development and, and events. And the stuff on the bottom is about habitat, protecting our birds, protecting our pollinators, protecting our wildlife, and protecting our human ability to both enjoy, learn about, and know nature. And it's a big job and um, there's a lot of work ahead, but we're fighting through the Outer Harbor Coalition. And um, I'm not gonna say we're winning, but we're, we're in pretty good shape because there aren't, aren't the kinds of development that had originally been proposed out there, which we'll talk about in a minute. Where we are on this planet really matters. We're in, we're in North America, we're in the Great Lakes. Great Lakes, uh, we're on the Niagara River. Um, and these are important places on the planet. 20% uh, of the Earth's fresh surface water is in the Great Lakes. 84% uh, of North Americans rely on the Great Lakes for drinking water. The place has been developed and urbanized throughout the Great Lakes. It's changed. It's changed a lot in the last 100 years, last 200 years. And our recognition of this and our recognition of the impacts on this is not, not we're not doing very well with that. Uh, and one of the results is climate change. Uh, and there's a lot of other negative results too. Uh, this shows the watershed of the Great Lakes um, in, in a very generic way. Uh, when we think about habitat and uh, conservation, watershed is a, is a big ingredient in how we look at it. And because what we do impacts the water and the water impacts us, clean water that we drink, uh, fresh drinking water, the way the water interacts with the atmosphere are all very important things in terms of how we think about a resilient future. There's a lot of issues that we're facing. Uh, birds have declined rapidly. I'm a bird guy, Jay Jean's a bird guy. We've lost a lot of birds in the last 50 years and we're continuing to lose birds. And um, our, our region is a very important critical area for migrating and nesting birds. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, for instance, we have birds that come here in the wintertime that summer in the Arctic, they, have, they do their babies and breeding in the Arctic. We have birds here in the summertime that winter in the Amazon. And these are different migratory routes that, that connect to where we are, our outer harbor, our greenway. And you know, often when we think about conservation, we think, well, you know, the Amazon, let's protect the Amazon, let's protect the Arctic. If we don't protect our area, if we don't protect these birds, for example, here, we're losing the fight to protect the Arctic and the Amazon. So we think global, act local, the idea of creating resiliency zones, which is the same as the sustainability zone is an important thing. Sustainability and resiliency involve social, economic and environmental consequences. And so the bottom right picture kind of shows um, the greenway area. 
the IBA, the important bird area that, that we've identified as is critical for birds. Um, moving through my slides here. Uh, so the Niagara River, globally significant important bird area in, in about 1996, uh, we created it recognizing the critical nature of this area for so many different kinds of birds. Uh, we've also recently, um, Jay Jean uh, was one of the architects of this, is the Ramsar Wetlands of International Importance, which covers most of the Niagara River on the US side and includes the Outer Harbor. And there's a lot of uh, agencies and organizations that have recognized this that's helped us uh, get the message out there that we need to conserve these places uh, for birds, for wildlife, and for humans. We have um, Doug Tallamy, who's a, who's a great author, and he's spoken in Buffalo a few times, who, who's described to us that 95% of the United States has been logged, tilled, drained, grazed, paved, or otherwise developed. 95% is not what its natural, historic, ancient habitat was. It, we've changed it. Uh, and that's what humans do. We change things for lots of different reasons. Um, economic development, sometimes we're fighting in the wilderness. There's a lot of reasons, but we've changed everything. And that's impacted us in very significant ways. Just last month, the United Nations issued uh, the sixth assessment report of climate change, and it's not a good, good thing. Um, it, basically, they're saying, you know, we can't stop it anymore. It, it's here, and it's going to get worse. And so uh, we can no longer stop global warming from intensifying over the next 30 years. But there are still some things we can do to help uh, lessen its impact. Obviously, climate change has weather issues, uh, you know, hurricanes, uh, heat waves, fires. There's so many things that are, that are affiliated with climate change that are very expensive. And um, we're, we're just in it so deep. And we have to figure out ways to lessen the impact. And we can still do that, especially here. So um, warming temperatures, biodiversity loss, carbon are all affiliated with climate change. And so how do we relate to that stuff locally? Uh, it, an interesting thing is we have a, a link to this sixth assessment that just came out from the in, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN uh, thing. The first assessment was released in Buffalo in about 1996, and it was a Great Lakes assessment. And I was lucky enough to be the host of that uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality was here. We had people from the University of Michigan, and they released the first report, and they told us what's going on here, um, what's going on in the Great Lakes, what's going on for the future. And, and even then, it was pretty dire. And, but we, it, you know, it sounded the alarm bells, and we started working very hard to alert local developers and governments what's coming and how important our region is. Uh, part of the goals of the United Nations uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, which is part of this sixth assessment, protect half of the earth by 2050, reduce habitat loss to zero by 2030. How does that impact us here? Well, um, I've, I've written in the Buffalo News and I've done a lot of lectures and I've worked with a lot of organizations and agencies. And um, it, it, we target places like the Outer Harbor uh, for appropriate development and places like the Greenway, because they are our connections to the uh, water and to the world in so many different ways. We are having problems here since 2019. We've had a number of big storms. Uh, we have historic high water levels. These are some images of flooding that happened on the Outer Harbor uh, in 219 and 220. Uh, it's catastrophic. You know, imagine if we had um, some of the development out there that's been proposed. Um, these are some of the proposals, these, these big buildings right on the waterfront. If there were people living there when these seiches and floods and big storms happened, sometimes with hurricane uh, force winds, people would die. And it's also sprawl, and that's expensive. Sprawl doesn't benefit anyone except for a few people. It doesn't benefit government. It doesn't benefit our pocketbooks. And so we have to work on developing a resilient region, and that involves social resiliency, which is the best use of public resources, dentist managed. Uh, mentioned that we try to keep public resources public, especially in the Outer Harbor. Economic resiliency, how does that look? I mean, we all need know how important money is. Uh, in a lot of ways, money has failed us. In a lot of ways, the kind of economic structure we have now, because it depends on extracting resources in so many ways, um, it's caused climate change. I, I think it's one of the greatest uh, causes of climate change is the way we do economics. We don't look at local economy as much as we should. Local economy means local businesses, local investments, and people care more about their place. If you have an extractive economy, um, taking water, taking timber, 
it, people, the people around those businesses don't really give a damn about Buffalo. And so then there's environmental and ecological resiliency, uh, which is a, a long story um, and complicated. And I, I don't have a lot of time to go into that now, but I can talk about it. Uh, I'm going to skip this one and I'm just going to go right now to um, introducing this next speaker uh, who um, I love. I've, I've, I've known him all of his life and I'm really proud of the work that he's done. One of the things that he did was he led the U.S. version of this Ramsar um, designation. And um, I'm going to just turn it over to him now and, and uh, we'll go there. Thanks, Dad. Um, let's see. So let me share my screen. So I am the deputy director at the Western York Land Conservancy. And um, so we're a land trust, uh, a, a not-for-profit that protects open spaces in Western New York. I think that, you know, I, I'm born and raised in Buffalo. And, and so I, I see it and I, I, I know that we often forget how important this place is. My dad touched on, on these things. Um, you know, we're one of the most biologically, ecologically important places in the entire world. And, and we don't realize it with the amount of fresh water we have, Niagara Falls, this natural wonder, um, forests and farmland that's very fertile. And these incredible migrations of wildlife, ancient fish in our lakes, birds passing through here on their way to other parts of the world. Um, it, this really is one of the most important places ecologically in the entire world. And you know, we've really spent the last 200 years not knowing that, destroying these places, dredging, hardening our shorelines, cutting our forests, paving, draining our wetlands. Um, and, and so I think a lot, a lot of that diversity is still here. A lot of what makes us special is still here. And I think at the Land Conservancy, what we are always trying to do is protect the places that are left and restore the places that we've lost. Um, and we do that with people, with communities, uh, and, and we do that in places that uh, really are spectacular. Um, and so this is just a, a simple map that shows where we've worked. Uh, since 1991, we've protected almost 7,500 acres of land on more than 90 properties in the Southern Tier, in Erie County, in Niagara County, throughout the region. Uh, and I'm just going to go quickly through some of those, those places just to give you a sense of, of what this region has and, and what communities have helped and what people have helped save. Um, this is the Stella Niagara Reserve on the Niagara River. Beautiful quarter mile of shoreline, a kayak launch that Waterkeeper helped build, trails, incredible indigenous history and uh, War, of, War of 1812 history and, and incredible diversity just being on the Niagara River. This is now a publicly accessible nature preserve, a place that could have been a hotel or a subdivision. Uh, Mossy Point uh, at the headwaters of the Niagara River. Uh, this is near our, our home office of Kenny Glenn. Um, with the community, we were able to protect another 200 acres of forest. Uh, this is surrounded by Hunters Creek County Park. So together there's 1100 acres of unbroken forest along more than two miles of Hunters Creek, which ends up in the Niagara River. And so what happens up here matters to everyone downstream. It's now a publicly accessible nature preserve. College Lodge, this old growth forest with this incredible wetland, carnivorous plants and orchids and 450 year old hemlocks. Uh, people helped raise the money to protect this place last year. Uh, this is down near Chautauqua or it's in Chautauqua County. It's one of the most spectacularly diverse places in, in the whole region. The Niagara Gorge. Uh, this is a place where we don't own the land, but we are working with state parks to restore the forests of the Niagara Gorge. Uh, incredible diversity of plants uh, in the Niagara Gorge that have, have been lost over the last hundred years. The, the gorge was industrialized with railroads and, and mills, and what's grown back has been a, a lot of non-native uh, plants. Norway maples, Atlantis, Phragmites. And so we've been spending the last three or four years controlling those non-native species and, and restoring the native forests. Incredible orchids, ancient uh, old growth, 800 year old white cedars in the gorge rim. This really is one of the most diverse places in the entire Great Lakes and, and, and a lot of it has disappeared. And so we're trying to stop that and, and, and reverse that, that decline. Um, we protect a lot of farmland, so we all need to eat. And West New York, some of us may not realize this, but has some of the most fertile soils in the entire world. When you look at a map of, of where you can grow food, arable land on earth, 
Western New York has a lot of it and a lot of places don't have any of it. And so we have to protect those places so that we can have food, uh, fresh you know, fruits and vegetables. Uh, we just started working with a, a community organization called the Providence Farm Collective. And, and they manage a farm that refugees and immigrants, uh, new Americans, have space to grow culturally appropriate foods. There's a 37 acre farm in Orchard Park that this organization is trying to buy. We are, this is where they're located, but they don't own the land yet. We're trying to help them raise the money to buy the land, uh, put a conservation easement on the land to protect it as farmland permanently, improve the, the farm so that they have the right facilities, a barn, um, and ensure that the, the organization and the farm can, can, can go on forever, can be sustainable. We just started that, that work. The river line, some of you might have heard, trying to create a nature trail and greenway right in the middle of Buffalo, uh, an unused railroad corridor extending from canal side through the valley, the first ward and Perry to the Buffalo River, um, trying to transform that into a place where people can connect with nature right where they live, where people can connect to the Buffalo River and our waterfront, and where we can connect communities that have been separated by this abandoned infrastructure, um, connect them back together with a, a nature trail and greenway. Um, and, and so this is a, I'm sure you've heard of this, the, the river line, which is still in its planning phases, but soon to be a real thing. And we are now beginning to work on um, protecting a 200 acre forest down near Allegheny State Park uh, and turn it into a, a publicly accessible nature preserve. So one of the things that makes this forest really, really special is that it has five American chestnuts that are more than 40 feet tall. And so if you know of the American chestnut, this is a tree that was very iconic huge trees dominated a lot of our forests, especially those in the Appalachians or the Allegheny foothills, wiped out by a blight 100 years ago. And so there are only remnants of this species left. And this property has more American chestnuts of that size, some even fruiting and flowering than anywhere outside of Zor Valley. And, and so we're trying to raise money right now to, to buy this land and, and turn it into a publicly accessible nature reserve. And that Allegheny Wildlands project is the way that we are kicking off a brand new, a new initiative called the Western New York Wild Way. We would like to connect the big forests in Northern Pennsylvania, Allegheny State Park, all the way through Western New York, up to the Iroquois National Wildlife, and eventually and ultimately over through the Finger Lakes to the Adirondacks and beyond. Uh, a connected corridor of protected places, for, you know, connecting the places that are already protected, protecting the places that aren't. Uh, and this would be part of what's called the Eastern Wild Way, uh, a corridor of wildlife habitat that would extend from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada, right through Western New York. And so the Western New York Wild Way is, is our way of connecting that, that landscape together so that, that plants and animals that have disappeared from our region can come back, so that plants and animals that need to find new territories uh, can roam across the landscape like they once did, and so that they can adapt as climate changes, so they can move around and find new homes as climate changes uh, their habitats. Uh, and so that, that's what the Western New York Land Conservancy is working on right now, and it, it's all about protecting what we have left and restoring what we've lost. So thank you. Very nice. Very nice presentations. So father-son combination here. <laughs> Uh, a real gift to our community uh, and a resource, treasured resource. So my co-host uh, in the series has been J.D. Hartman. And uh, J.D., uh, uh, what do you think? What's, what's, uh, which direction shall we go with the Q&A here? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to say that when I moved back to my hometown of Buffalo 20 so years ago, I, I met Jay and he, he inspired me. I had worked 20 years on Wall Street and uh, I met Jay with a group called the Revolutionary Council, and uh, it inspired me to get involved in the uh, socially responsible investing aspect of finance. And it, it's been uh, it's been quite a trip for me. And Jay Jay really was an inspiration. So thank you, and thank you for all your good work. You mentioned about winning and losing a couple times out on the Outer Harbor once specifically. So. Um, Let's talk about the big, the big battle. Are we winning or losing? Is it getting better or worse? Oh, Jay, Jay is uh, silent, so maybe I'll move there on. There you go. Okay, I've got it now. There you go. I had to, yeah, you had to do it. Well, I mean, we've been fighting out there to limit um, condos, to limit sprawl, 
And uh, over the years, we, we fought some pretty fierce battles and uh, the Erie Canal Harbor Development Corporation, which is a development corporation who controls all of that land. And their motivation is to make money and to make it what they call productive. Our motivation is to keep it green, to make it resilient, to think about conservation and ecology because it is such an important connection to the lake. Right now, we don't have condos, we don't have sprawl. Um, we have more of a park-like setting, but we're concerned that that won't last much longer. They're continually trying to introduce little development strategies uh, and we're continuing to try to promote green space and park space. Currently, we're working to have that land transferred to another state agency like State Parks, uh, which understands more about parks and doesn't concern itself so much with development. So we're winning and we don't have a thousand blocks of condos out there. We're losing because we're not there yet. And we're at a place in time where we don't have a lot of time left to make these decisions that will protect our future. So. Thank you. And just for uh, folks, uh, information. There's a website, ouroutherharbor.org. And in that is a uh, white paper by Sam McGavern. He wrote it uh, for the Our Outer Harbor Coalition in Open Buffalo. And it's about creating a world-class park. So anyway, thanks for your, your work, Jay. Hey, Jajine, I've had a front row seat to the growth of the Western New York Land Conservancy. In my book, Waterkeeper and you guys have really performed it at a at a world class level. What's your secret sauce? What's the formula? <laughs> yeah, seriously, I know I'm putting you on the spot to talk yeah. about yourself, but you and Nancy are pretty, and everyone are remarkable. Yeah, well, I think I mean definitely Nancy. Nancy gives a lot of credit. Our executive director, she she has a, a vision for what we can do, um, and and we yeah we've been able to expand over the last ten years because of that. Uh, you know, JD, you've been a part of that too. A lot of people on this call have been a part of that. Dennis has been a part of that. My dad's been a part of that. Um, and I think that the the key to the land conservancy success, yes, I think we have an excellent staff. You know, very brilliant people, passionate people, people who are doing exactly what they want to be doing. Um, that's why they're working for the land conservancy. But the reality is, it takes the entire community. You know, the, the projects that we work on, the places that we work. Usually someone from the community brings those to us. Usually it's an entire community that wants to save those places. And when we get into fundraising, I mean, I might write good letters. I'll give myself credit for writing good letters, but it takes hundreds of people to raise the money, to be passionate about it, to make, make sure everyone knows about it, to save these places that matter to so many people. So it's, it's yes, the Land Conservancy, you know, staff and structure and organization, but it's really the communities in Western New York, the people in Western New York that save the places and we help. Mm -hmm. That's our role. Yeah, well, thank you. Those are uh, most appropriate questions, thanks. Let's see what we have at the library. Uh, any questions coming in from our audience? We do not currently have any questions. It's but just a, a reminder, if you want to submit a question, you can put it in the chat and we'll take it from there. I, I'd like to just, add something if I could. Um, I just want to talk about JJ in a little bit. His work conserving land, what the West New York Land Conservancy does is amazing stuff. And I'm so proud that he's been able to contribute as much as he has, which is a lot. And, um, you know, thanks, JG. And I think you probably hear this from me you know, more often than not, but I thought this is a good place to to say it to you. Well, I probably got it from you, so thank you. <laughs> Certainly yeah, some your mother, sitting, your mother is sitting right here. Too. Oh, you're, I'm yeah. you, you too, Mom. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Here's uh, and the focus on the outer harbor, and I try to do that with this series, uh, uh, having folks from exploring more uh, the Children's Museum. How do we create that culture, uh, literally starting with uh, youth pre-K uh, uh, through the early years as an exploring more can, can help us do. Uh, uh, the the merry-go-round, the, the carousel, how do we uh, have a heritage carousel uh, pointing to the importance of that area that a canal side and as a component of the outer harbor. Uh, we've had uh, the power authority. Um, uh, so all of this, a uh, couple speakers from UB, uh, very much involved with sustainability. Uh, I, I, I wanna 
pick your brains right here next week. JD and I will host the final of the 10 week program. Uh, and really it'll be a discussion. We'll invite back all the speakers uh, that have uh, participated uh, and as many as possible can attend and really say, well, what's next? Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, this Imagine series will keep the fourth week, fourth Tuesday, uh, which is dedicated to uh, science and nature and try to keep this momentum going. But what would be your thoughts? What, what ideas do you have to say, all right, we've got current discussions on the Outer Harbor. So let's focus on that because it is current. Uh, uh, how, uh, uh, amphitheaters, uh, we had Jill on last week from the Riverkeeper and it sounds like understandings were at hand, some compromises uh, of small development pieces and, and most of it uh, a nature preserve. That's at least what I heard. What, what's your thought? Is there room for compromise? Is it all or none? It's got to all be nature, uh, zero development. What, what, what do you guys add to that discussion? I think it can never be all or nothing. I mean, we have to compromise, but we have to be careful what we compromise on. We have to understand what our values are. And we've established some pretty solid values about the Outer Harbor. One is we don't want to privatize it. Keep it public. It's yeah. a public resource. The other is don't develop things out there that are inappropriate for the outer harbor. Housing is inappropriate. There's a lot of things that are inappropriate. What is appropriate? Well, I mean, it's a big conversation. I think that one of the things that we, we can do and have to do, and this, this program that you guys do is important. We have to keep people engaged, aware, educated. And COVID has been a, a difficult time for everyone. And uh, some people have gone out more and see more of nature, and that's been a benefit. And some people are just isolated. And kids in schools, um, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge right now, but we just have to keep, keep doing it, keep talking about it, keep coming up with programs and um, saving land like Jay Jean does. And we're doing it, we're not giving up. Um, and uh, if somebody wants to do something out there, you know, we're gonna be there to talk about it. Jay Jean, uh, uh, or Jay, let me just follow up with that. The uh, one picture you showed of the, uh, I think it was after the October 2019 storm, almost that Lake Seish that, uh, that uh, showed the commercial slip, I think the water up to the, the bottom of the bridge, uh, 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 the signage. To, to imagine to making development out there with that story or to see the devastation of Times Beach after it had just been fixed, uh, the boardwalks and whatnot. Uh, I, I'd encourage those images to get out as much as possible to show the power of a storm that you can't build enough break walls to yeah. prevent from happening. And after this last week's uh, episodes in Tennessee, uh, uh, they're, they're once in every 500 year storms uh, are suddenly happening in the same spot every 10 years uh, and, and killing and wiping out uh, small creeks become uh, major onslaughts for destruction of life and limb. Uh, that's the message that I think is so visual. It's, it goes beyond words. So I encourage those images of just Times Beach uh, and the destruction in that park that's been closed to all of us uh, for the last, uh, what, two years now, I think, uh, just after they repaired it. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, climate change is real and it's hitting us hard. And, and the storms that you're seeing uh, and talking about more than every 10 years and we've had like eight of them in the past two years and the instability of our climate is going to bring more storms more powerful storms we had some high lake water levels um a year ago we don't have that right now i don't know what's going to happen next month or in the next six months but they're going to come at us and it's not just the outer harbor canal side has been flooded a number of times um and just in the last couple of years so what do we do? How do we build there? And we have to focus on doing the appropriate thing for nature, for wildlife, and for humanity, not only because we want to save the planet, but we don't want to get people killed. I mean, just imagine if there was condos out there and that, that flood had, Furman Boulevard was overtopped a number of times. There's debris on the other side of, from the lake of Furman Boulevard. That's bad stuff. And ex fixing the break walls, fixing Times Beach, it's all very expensive. And those are costs that we have to bear. 
uh, that result from, you know, not measuring uh, the real cost of doing environmental destruction, which includes sprawling condos and just inappropriate development. Melissa, I, I, I think some chat came in. Do you want to update us on that? Yes, there's a few comments, I'll say. I'm not sure if they're exactly questions, but perhaps you guys can address them. I'll just kind of tie them together. Uh, the first one is, I am very concerned about the large grove of trees near the proposed amphitheater on the outer harbor. I counted about 100 trees there. Its loss in favor of a commercial concert venue makes me sick. What can we do? Yeah, so that's, we that's the first one, but the second one might be kind of tied to that. So uh, someone said there is a Facebook group, the Outer Harbor Park Club, that has been organized to stop the development down there. Um, so that seems perhaps like it's a bit tied. And then the, the last comment is, already there is a blight in Canal Side, the old Hatch restaurant and the upscale one that was opened a few years ago, both closed, blocking the waterfront. And just a reminder of what happens when things lose their interest. Well, let me answer um, the first one first, the trees. They're, they're critical trees and they're not, it's not an old growth forest, it's an emerging forest. And there's a, there are more than a hundred trees there and they are slated to be taken down for the, um, whatever it's called, the amphitheater. And that's disturbing, that shouldn't be done. We don't have that many trees out there. So what can you do? Right to the mayor, right to the county executive, right to the ECHDC, right to the governor, right to all of your elected officials and let them know you're concerned about it. So that's an important citizen response. We also have a petition um, and you can sign our petition. And by the way, we have a Facebook page that in, including uh, the Outer Harbor Club, we have an Our Outer Harbor uh, Facebook page and we, we share a lot of information there. Um, I, I think you're right about the hatch and all of that development. There's a lot of development in the inner harbor. Um, we don't want the outer harbor to look like the inner harbor for a lot of reasons. Um, and businesses have suffered, especially during the pandemic. So what do we invest in? Um, what's the appropriate business? It's a big conversation. Eugene, anything to add? Because you uh, created this award uh, or, or did the legwork to get this award for the whole Niagara uh, River region. Uh, uh, powerful uh, um, example of good, good volunteer work, if you will, that the whole community has uh, been behind you to get. So uh, hats off to you for that. Do you wanna add anything further and, uh, to either of those comments or any closing thoughts? Sure. Yeah, I think just going to that the that Ramsar idea that you just mentioned. Um, you know, Ramsar is an international designation for wetlands of global importance because of their their biodiversity. And so, right now, the, the Niagara River, the U.S. side of the Niagara River, received that designation two years ago. All the green spaces along its edges are part of that. Uh, it doesn't come with any rules or restrictions or laws. It's it's simply a designation. It's kind of like an award saying that this place is one of the most important places in the world. It's, it's a designation shared by the Galapagos and the Everglades and the Niagara River right here. Um, and so I think that's, that's the work, you know, in, in protecting the places that we have left, restoring what's lost, it takes a reimagination yeah. of what we have. We have to know that this place is important for us to want to protect it, for us to want to restore it. And Ramsar is one of those tools that says, you may not realize this, but it's actually one of the most important places in the world. And that's that's the point of Ramsar. And I think the point of what my dad does and you do in this this speaking series, this does, it's 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 changing, helping change the way people think about where we live. Nice, nice. Guys, we have to wrap up. Uh, I'm gonna encourage you, you're both part of uh, substantial networks. Uh, uh, invite folks next week uh, to be part of it. It's a chance for the Q&A. Uh, um, my goal is that this whole 10 week program uh, is seen as a package of educational material. Uh, I think Western New York, uh, Buffalo and um, uh, Western New York can be a certainly a participant nationally and internationally uh, as we look at sustainability. What, what does a community, uh, what does a sustainable community look like? We've got all these uh, edges, waters, edges, if you will, uh, covering our community from rivers and creeks and uh, uh, and lakes. Um, and as it's been stated over and over again, uh, 
Yeah, it, there's only about one percent of the of all the water in the world uh, is is accessible fresh water, and one fifth of that is flowing right by uh, Greater Buffalo. So uh, we we really have some important role to play in for ourselves and in leadership for others that are all uh, grappling with the same issues of sustainability. How do you make a community do its part? And uh, that's what the series has been about. Uh, my thanks to the uh, library again for hosting this as part of the Imagine program. Uh, this is um, uh, a, an ongoing discussion and, and next week we'll plan on at least brainstorming, if you will, how that might look going forward. So I'm Dennis Galecki. Uh, my thanks to everyone for uh, all the viewers. We had a great crowd watching uh, and participating today. So thank you. Uh, please come by, uh, tell your friends and neighbors, check the library YouTube site uh, and Facebook page for uh, 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 this production, if you will. And, um, and join us next week, if at all possible. Thank you and be well. Thank you, Dennis. I thought that was great. Thank you both guys. Well done. Well done. I'll, I'll be here next week. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try to as well. All right. Thanks. Bye. See you guys. Bye.